All right, Unit 1, Module 4, we end that. So, by the way, just a reminder, we have our homework assignment for Unit 1, Module 4, due this Sunday at 11.59 p.m. Always remember, uh, we have our homework assignments due on Sundays at 11.59 p.m. That hasn't changed. It's not going to change. I do not, um, you know, anticipate on changing that either. Okay. All right. And then tomorrow we have reading assignment due, and then I already opened uh, the worksheets for the next exam as well. Please do not wait till the exam week to start the work the worksheets. All right, you're gonna run out of time. All right, anyway, those are just some reminders. Anyway, so let's talk about mass spectrometry. Now, in this class, I will not require you to know how the mass spectrometry works, but I mean, uh, I want you to give you an idea about a rough idea about how things work in mass spectrometry. Okay, because that is essential, you know, uh, to understand uh, I mean, what we're doing now. All right. Now, by the way, how many of you have seen uh, a television series called Cosmos? Can I see the hands? Cosmos. Thank you. All right. By the way, it, until you watch that, watch that series called Cosmos, you, are, you cannot be, call yourself a scientist. All right. So if you get a chance before graduating, watch Cosmos. You have to. All right. <laughs> So I think in, it's in the second episode of uh, the, sec the, the second Cosmos, we, the Neil deGrasse Tyson explains like how mass spectrometry works and then how they use that to determine the age of the uh, Earth. Okay. Now, if you can remember that, so the first step of mass spectrometry is to vaporize the sample. Okay. Because we are not going to inject liquid or, uh, or, or solid there. We need the vapor of the sample. And once we have the vapor, we are going to make uh, the charged particles. So we're going to ionize the, the particles. Okay. And uh, by what, what I mean, what we do here is we expose our particles um, to an electric field. And okay. And in that electric field, we are going to be ionizing our particles. Once we have ionized particles, these ionized particles are accelerated through a magnetic field. Okay. That's our second step. And then in the magnetic field, when the charged particles travel through a magnetic field, they separate into um, separate based on their masses into separate beams. Okay. And at the end of the day, it's going to spit out uh, a spectrum called mass spectrum, which looks something like this. I'm going to try to draw that here. Okay. So it has the y axis and the x axis. And the, the, the y axis is either relative intensity or something like that, which we don't care that much. Intensity. But the x-axis is mass divided by the charge. Sometimes we write M over Q, or sometimes we write mass or M divided by Z. They mean the same thing. Here, the, uh, the Q or Z is the charge. All right, charge is Q. OZ. Okay. And for our case, for 151, this charge, this is Z by the way, is always set to plus one. Meaning the x axis reading directly gives you the mass of the particle. Okay. And then at the end, based on the mass of your particles, okay, say that you have two different particles with two different uh, masses, you're going to see peaks there. Okay. One, two or something like that, depending on the mass of the particle. So M1 particles with uh, um, the mass of M1 and then particles with uh, mass of M2 and so forth. All right, and that is what we're interested in, okay? The mass spectrum, uh, what we, which we get from, uh, as a result of doing mass spectrometry on our sample. All right, do we have any questions, concerns, comments so far? Anything? Okay, so, now, you see that for this technique to work, we need to be able to produce charged particles. Okay, that means we need to have an electric charge there. Okay, Meaning, our particles should have a charged nature. Right? That means the atoms that the particles are made of okay, should have something that gives charge to that particle. The, the, the atoms okay so what we're going to do in the next five minutes is we're going to think about the what what the atoms are made of in other words the subatomic particles we're going to go to the atom level zoom into the atom now 
And then once we do that, we're going to think about which one of these particles are charged and what the charges are. That's going to be the goal for the first five to 10 minutes of this class. All right, so let's try this. Here you go, I'll give you a minute in your groups. All right, I have more than 90% answers now. I'm gonna close this question in five, four, three, two, and one. All right, and here are our responses. Oh, look at that. That's beautiful. <laughs> yep, there you go. Okay. Anyway, so we know our subatomic particles. That's what it says. All right. So, yeah, we have the, in atoms, we have protons, neutrons, and electrons. By the way, where do we have protons and neutrons in an atom? Thank you, in the nucleus. Okay. What about the electrons? Where do we find the electrons? Okay, I, I hear different things. I see, I hear spheres, I hear orbit circles. All right, which which one is it? All right, yeah. So now I mean I understand. Okay, I mean if you say orbit or circle, I mean I understand that's that's one of the models we use. It's called the Bohr model. I used to uh, understand or explain the atom. Okay, uh, but when it comes to the electron, electron moves all the time. It's a tiny particle that obnoxious move all the time, okay? As a result of that, we cannot pinpoint the position of that electron in the space at a given time, okay? So uh, that's called the Heisen, uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, okay? So instead, what, what scientists do is they define a space, a, a region of space where this electron can be found around the nucleus, and that is called the electron cloud, okay? So again, in an atom, we have the protons and nu uh, the neutrons in the nucleus in the center, and then we have the electron cloud around it. Okay, so that's the idea about the atom. We will talk more about that when we talk about the hydrogen atom a little bit later in unit two. Now, there are two important things that we need to uh, uh, acknowledge here, okay? The size of the atom, okay? If you compare the atom to a football stadium, okay, the nucleus is like the football at the center of the stadium. It's, it's tiny, okay? All the mass, like the neutrons and the protons, are concentrated into that tiny, tiny point called the nucleus, okay? The rest of the space, the stadium, or the size of the atom is determined by the electron cloud, okay? So electron cloud takes up much more space than uh, the, the the nucleus itself, okay. And then in other words, okay, what I'm what I'm what I'm saying in a different different words is, most of us, which are made of we are made of atoms, right? We are empty space, okay. Most of us are empty space because you know that space is basically the region where electron can be found, okay. That's that's basically empty space. Anyway, do we have any questions, concerns, comments about that? Anything? All right, so again, the size of the atom is determined by the uh, the electron cloud. Let me actually show you an image, okay? Right, the nucleus contains neutrons and protons, okay? And uh, the, the, the size of the atom is determined by the electron cloud because compared to the nucleus, the electron cloud is, uh, the, is much, much larger. Okay, that's the idea there. All right, anyway, it's already here. So what's the charge of the nucleus? Come that again, I didn't hear you. It's positive, okay? And what's the charge of the electron? It's negative. So altogether, the atom, I mean, uh, if they have this... Uh, by the way, I mean, I, I think I, I'm jumping the gun here a little bit. But out of the subatomic particles, which particle... All right, five more seconds. Please submit your answers. I have more than 90% answers now. Three seconds. One second. All right. So here are our responses. Okay. Right. And as you're correctly pointing out, okay, proton is positively charged, electron is negatively charged, and the neutron, what's the charge of the neutron? No charge. Okay. Just like the bartender said, okay, when they ask, uh, for the, the, the charge for the drink. Anyway, 
Now that's that's a bad neutron joke, but I have a good photon joke. Le- remind me when we talk about the photons. So, I mean, you know, talk about the photon joke. Okay. All right. Do we have any questions, concerns, comments at the moment? Anything? Okay. Okay. So we know the charges of the subatomic particles, right? Now, this means if we have a neutral atom, okay. Uh, so for example, let's say that we have a neutral atom that contains three protons. How many electrons would it contain? Everybody. Three, right? Because protons and electrons have the same magnitude of charge, but opposite signs. Okay. Therefore, if we have a neutral atom, they should have the same number of protons and electrons. Okay. So uh, that's the idea there. All right. Now we got that down. What I want to do now is talk a little bit about how to find the number of protons in a given element. Okay. Now, does anybody know how to determine the number of protons any element has? Anybody? How do we know that? Reese? The periodic table. Okay. So what number in the periodic table in a given symbol tells you the number of protons it has? Can I have the microphones? Where, where are the microphones? Okay. Thank you, Sura. Can I have the microphone, Reese, please? Yes, Reese, right? Yeah. Reese, thank you. Go ahead. You're right. So where do we find the, uh, the the number of protons of an element in the periodic table? The atomic number. The atomic number, right? So keep the microphone, Reese, okay? So here's a part of the periodic table, okay? So for example, let's take beryllium, all right? You said that you had two numbers, one with two decimal places, the other one is a whole number, okay? We know the, the one with two decimal places is what? What is that? Mass. That's the relative atomic mass. That's the relative atomic mass, right? In atomic mass units. And then the other number over here is, Reese? The atomic number. Is the atomic number, okay? The atomic number tells you the number of protons an element has. Yeah? Now, here's the other thing that you, you cannot forget. The identity of an element is determined by the number of protons it has. Okay? So you should not ever change the number of protons of an element because they don't like it. All right? It changes identity. All right? For example, if you take hydrogen, hydrogen will always have one proton. The atomic number is one, always one. If you take neon, neon will always have 10 protons. The atomic number of neon is 10. Sodium, 11. Magnesium, 12. Okay? And so forth. So that number is unique to that given element. All right? Anyway, do we have any questions, concerns, comments so far? Now, so far, this is what we know. We know how to determine the number of protons an element has. What do we do? We go to the periodic table and then we take the whole number, okay, of that element, okay, that is the atomic number or the number of protons it has. If you know the number of protons, if somebody asks you the number of electrons it has when it is neutral, it's going to be the same as the number of protons, okay? And that's how we determine the number of protons and uh, electrons of a given uh, element. All right. What questions, concerns, comments do we have at the moment? Anything? Any questions, concerns, comments? Okay. All right. Now I'm going to repeat a little bit. Okay. The charge of the, the magnitude of the charge of the electron is same as the charge, the magnitude of the charge of a proton and the opposite in charges. Okay. We know that. And the other thing I want you to acknowledge is the mass of electron. Okay. The mass of an electron is about one two thousandth of the mass of a proton or a neutron. Okay. In other words, the mass of the electron is negligible compared to the mass of a proton or a neutron. Okay, that's all I'm saying here. Okay, it's so tiny. The mass of an electron is so so less compared to the mass of a proton or a neutron. All right, do we have any questions, concerns, comments at the moment? Anything? Any questions, concerns, comments? All right, so with 
that, what I want to do is to have some fun with this information. Let's try this. Okay. So let's make a charged uh, um, species, charged particle. All right. I'm going to close this question in five, four, three, two, and one. All right. And then here are our responses. Oh, look at that. Okay. Now, I'm kind of surprised, like, you know, like <laughs> options A and B, people selecting options A and B. But that's okay. Now, let's think about this, all right? We are told that we have 10 protons, okay? So the number of protons in all three cases is 10, 10, and 10, right? If we have 10 protons, and these are number of electrons, and 10 electrons, what would be the net charge? Everybody, zero, it should be zero, okay? They should cancel each other out. If we have 10 protons and 11 electrons, what would be the charge? Negative one, because you have more negative particles, negative charges, or more negativity in you compared to the positivity. Not in you, I mean in particle, right? Okay, because of that, you're negative. All right, so that's negative. And the last one, we have 10 protons and nine electrons. What would be the charge here then? It should be plus one. Okay, why? You have more positive charges, more positively charged particles than the negatively charged particles. Therefore, you are net positive. Okay, that's why most of us selected that option. Do we have any questions, concerns, comments at the moment? Anything? Any questions, concerns, comments? Now, Please remember this, okay? Whenever we create or whenever we produce charged particles, okay, we do that by adding or removing electrons. We never produce charged particles by adding or removing protons. Can you tell me why though, anybody? Why aren't we adding or removing uh, protons? Yes. Thank you, sir. I'll come back to you. Yes, sir. What's your name, sir? I'm, I'm Jack. Uh, Jack, go ahead. You change the identity of... Thank you. Because if you add or remove protons, you change the identity of that element. Okay? They don't like it. Don't do it. <laughs> All right? Don't change the identity of, identity of those elements by changing the number of protons. You can only make charged particles by adding or removing electrons. That's it. Okay? It can be done, by the way. You can change the number of protons, but that is called particle physics, not chemistry. Now, in chemistry, we only deal with electrons, right? We're going to try to keep the uh, the uh, the the overall atom happy by not changing its identity. All right. Anyway, um, any questions, concerns, comments? Okay. Now, if that is the case, I'll reopen this question in case you're revised to answer some of you. But let's try this. Where am I? Let me get rid of my doodling first. All right. So let's think about neon. Okay. If you go to the periodic table, you should be able to find the relative atomic mass of neon. What is it? Yeah, professors. Oh. All right. Now, before I look at your answers, okay. So, oh. so every morning I try to weigh myself. Okay. So this morning I weighed myself with my glasses on. Okay, I weighed around 138 pounds. Okay, now I forgot to take my glasses off. So what do you think, if I took my glasses off, what would be my weight then? It should be the same, right? Because the mass of my glasses is negligible compared to my mass, okay? Therefore, the mass wouldn't change. The same thing happens with the electrons. The mass of the electrons is negligible compared to the mass of the atom. Therefore, removing or adding an electron will not change the mass of the atom, okay? So the mass of neon plus is going to be mass of neon, which is 20.18, all right? Anyway, do we have any questions, concerns, comments at the moment? Anything? Any questions, concerns, comments? Yes, Novea. 
Wait, so what if this said So what if this said instead of a plus it was a minus? What would the could is that a is that a possibility? Yeah, I mean you can have yeah. minus one. Yeah. So what would be what would be the mass then? Oh, it's the same. It should be the same, right? You're adding an electron. I mean, so I I mean instead of writing one, I'm gonna add two of this. It's not gonna change my mass. Yeah? It's the same thing. Uh-huh. All right, do we have any other questions, concerns, comments about that? All right, now, if that is the case, yeah, most of us got there. I'll reopen the question for you. All right, let's do this now, okay? Now, what I want you to do is, now, let's say that you actually did this experiment in the lab. Like, you took the mass spectrum of neon. You measured the mass spectrum of neon, okay? What I want you to do is I want you to tell me, I want you to show me what you what you what you uh, expect to see. Here you go. So remind us. We have relative intensity on the y-axis. And then on the x-axis, we have the, uh, the mass or mass of charge, whatever. This is intensity. Relative intensity. And then here we have the mass to charge ratio. A peak. Oh, give me a second. We expect to see a peak, okay, around 20.18. That's it. Okay, because neon, if the neon particles have a mass of 20.18, then the mass spectrum should show us a peak at 20.18. That's it. All right. Do we have any questions, concerns, comments at the moment? Anything? Any questions about that? Nobody? Nobody read the textbook? Okay. Now, however, okay, when you actually, if you actually do the experiment, you are not going to see a peak at 20.18. All right. For neon. Okay. What you're going to see is, let me show you. Let's do the experiment. Okay. All right, here's our experiment. Oh, give me a second. Okay. So here are my neon particles. Everybody knows that neon is yellowish. I was kidding. I mean, nobody knows. Anyway, so uh, these are the vaporized neon particles. So I'm gonna send, I'm gonna ionize them and send it through, send them through a magnetic field. And then it's gonna separate into uh, different beams based on their mass, and then it's gonna spit out the mass spectrum of neon like that. So we see instead of one peak, three peaks for neon. Not one, three peaks. And get this, none of them are 20.18. All right? So the total peak is around 20. The other one is 21. And there's another one at 22. What's going on here? Anybody? Why do we get three masses for neon? But we have the same neon. But why do we have three different masses? Anybody? I see, I see a few hands. Can I talk to C Simon? Simon, right? Who? Simeon? Uh, okay. Uh, what, remind me your name so one more time. Simeon. Simeon. Yeah. Simeon. Okay, Simeon. I'm sorry. Simeon, go ahead. It has different peaks because some neon atoms have more neutrons. Than okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so they have the same number. Keep the microphone. They have the same number of protons. But some neon particles have more neutrons in it, okay? As a result of that, they are heavier, yeah? So anybody, what do we call this? If we, So we have the same number of protons, but different numbers of neutrons. We call a specific name for them. Do we, do we know that? Then what do we call this? We call them isotopes. Thank you. We call them isotopes of neon. Okay, so isotopes have the same number of protons because that's the identity of that element, okay? But they have different numbers of neutrons. Okay, that's the idea there. All right, so do we have any questions, concerns, comments at the moment, anything? At this point, I wanna do something on my notebook. If I can. Okay. So what we noticed was for neon, instead of one peak, we got three, one at 20, 
a small one at 21, little bit taller, taller peak at 22. Okay. So these are my relative intensity. Okay. This was, if I can remember the numbers, give me a second. We have 90.48% for 20, 0.27% for 21, and 9.25% for 22. Okay, this is what we have. Now, what we know now is, we, if we're talking about neon, we know the number of protons they should have. They should all have, how many protons, everybody? How many protons should neon have? 10, it's not gonna change, okay? It's always 10, all right? So it's gonna be 10, 10, and 10. So we said that if we are different isotopes, only thing that's gonna vary is the number of neutrons, okay? So if we have neon 20, how many neutrons do you expect to have there? Neon 20 has how many, how many neutrons? 10, okay? 10 plus 10, 20. Neon 21, how many neutrons would we have there? 11, thank you. Neon 22, how many neutrons? 12. There you go. And that's why they have different masses there. Okay. And also, there's something else I'm going to do. There's something called the atomic symbol. Okay. In the atomic symbol, we write, so here's the, here's the atomic symbol for neon. Okay. We write the number of, protons or the atomic number at the bottom left. And then we, we write what we call the mass number, which is the total number of protons and neutrons at the, to, uh, at, at the top left. Okay, so for this, for neon 20, we write the atomic symbol for neon 20 like this. For neon 21, should be still 10, but we have 21 the number of protons plus neutrons, the sum of protons plus neutrons is 21 now. And for neon 22, this is 10, but this is 22. The mass number is 22. Okay, yeah, all the way. All right, by the way, this is called the atomic number, and this is called the mass number. Okay, atomic number is the number of protons, and the mass number is protons plus neutrons. All right, do we have any questions, concerns, comments? Yes, sir. Can I have the microphone there, Marcelli? What's your name, sir? Uh, Mac. Mac, Mac, go ahead. I was just wondering why we write the number of protons if we already write the atom, because wouldn't that always... Yeah, it's redundant. Yeah. I hear you. Okay. Yeah, we don't, it's a, sometimes we don't do it, but if you say it, that's what it means. Okay, sometimes when we introduce like unknown samples, unknown atoms for in, uh, in, in questions, we have, I mean, we, we might use that information. Yeah. What other questions, concerns, comments do we have at the moment? Anything? Okay. Now, here's the other thing we want to tackle here. Now, we see that none of these are in the periodic table. Okay, for neon, the relative the, the periodic table tells us the relative atomic mass of neon is 20.18, which is not 20, not 21, not 22. So where does this 20.18 come from? Okay, now it turns out it is the average relative atomic mass of uh, all the isotopes we have in neon. Okay, it's the weighted average of uh, the the isotopes we have in neon. Okay, what do I mean by mean by that? It's like the G, your GPA, right? So your homework has ten percent weight of homework is ten percent weight of exams is like forty percent weight of the lab is twenty five percent. Okay, so when you calculate your final grade, we have to take the weighted average of the, all those components. We do the same thing here. Okay, here's how it goes. I think we already know this because uh, anyway, now. This is what it tells us, okay? If you take 100 atoms of neon, okay, 90.48 out of 100 has a mass of 20, okay? To that, we need to add a neon 21, okay? If you take 100 atoms of neon, 
0.27 out of 100 atoms will have a mass of 21. And then we have neon 22. Okay. If you take 100 atoms of neon, 9.25 out of that 100 atoms will have a mass of 22. Okay. Can somebody plug and chuck these numbers into your calculators and let me know the number you get? get on your whiteboard. There should be a whiteboard at each table with a marker pen. I want you to write the uh, answer on something, okay? 187. All right. So, yeah, thank you. Now, that is what is given to you in the periodic table as well, okay? 20.18, okay? Now, you see that you are getting close to 20.19 because I use 20 instead of 19.99, which is the actual mass here I mean, okay so let me show you what i mean give me a second so the actual mass of um the neon 20 isotope is 19.99 you'll be given that information if you need that okay and then the the 21 is 20.99 and then 22 is 21.99 and then if you do the math you're going to get 20.18 uh, with the same calculation okay which is close enough Okay, and that is called the average relative atomic mass. And that is what the periodic table tells you as the uh, relative atomic mass of a given element. All right, what questions, concerns, comments do we have at the moment? Anything? Any questions? All right, so you will have to do this uh, in a quiz or an exam for sure, okay? So I'm telling you a quiz question right away. Um, now, with that information, what I want to do is um, we talked about the atomic numbers and the mass numbers and the atomic symbols of uh, of different isotopes and so forth. But what I want to do now is to go back to the first question I gave you at the beginning of the class. I'll give you one more minute. Go ahead. And write the identity of this element on your whiteboards, okay? Once you have the the, uh, the average relative atomic mass for the unknown element, write the identity as well. 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. All right. And before I look at your answers, okay, can I see your whiteboards, please? What's the identity of the element? I see B, 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 which is boron. Yeah. So how did we get that? Okay. One more time. Thank you. Okay. So how do we get this? Well, I mean, how do we determine the identity? So out of 100 atoms, we are told that 20 of them, I want a different, give me a second. Just bear with me. I want a different yeah. pen with a different thickness. Okay. So. We have two isotopes. First of all, here are the information we get from this uh, this mass spectrum, okay? We have two isotopes. Why? There are two peaks, okay? And one of them has a mass of 10. The other one is has a mass of 11, plus 11, okay? So from um, bor from um, the 10, mass of 10 isotope, okay? If we take 100 atoms of this particular species, 20 of them will have a mass of 10. And then if you take 100 atoms of this, okay, 80 of them will have a mass of 11. That's what it tells us, okay? Now, if you just plug and chuck these numbers from this, you're going to get 2. And then from this, you're going to get 8.8, .8, okay? Altogether, you're going to get 10.8 as so average relative atomic mass. And now we take this to the periodic table. And then we check which atom or which element has a relative atomic mass of 10.8. Uh, and the only element with a relative atomic mass of 10.8 is boron. And that's how we identify that element. Yeah? All right. What questions, concerns, comments do we have at the moment? Anything? 
Any questions, concerns, comments? All right. Now, I know, now this is boring, right? So the attempts are boring. I understand that. Okay, let's do something interesting. So what we're going to do next is we're going to go from atoms to, look at that, it's beautiful. Atoms to molecules. Okay. Now, when it comes to molecules, molecules are much more interesting because you're going to see more peaks. Okay. You might see that it's going to make our life complicated because we have more peaks. Okay. But it's more interesting because it's going to give us more information about how the molecule is mo molecule was made. Okay. Now, anyway, here's an example. If you take the mass spectrum of methane, CH4, right, we're going to see like a lot of peaks. Okay. We know the molar mass of CH4 is carbon is 12, hydrogen is 1. We have four of them, which is 16. Okay. So we're going to see a peak at 16 for methane, CH4. I'm going to say it's plus 1 because, you know, otherwise the mass spectrum will not detect it. Okay. And then we have a peak at 15. Anybody? Why do we get a peak at 15? Any ideas? It's CS3, right? So we get it of one hydrogen atom. Okay, you're going to get a mass of 15. Get two hydrogen atoms out, then you're going to get CH2 with a mass of 14. Get one out, uh, actually, no, three out, then you're going to get CH with a mass of 13. Okay, get all of them out, all the hydrogens out, then you're going to get just carbon with a mass of 12. So, anyway. Now this is why the molecules are interesting because you're going to get more peaks based on the based on what the molecule is made of. Now just to make sense of this, I know that this is not registering it yet, registering yet, but here's the analogy. Okay, imagine that I have a box that contains hundred ornaments. Okay, and these hundred ornaments are made of three parts. Um, okay, give me a second. Okay, three parts. A pyramid, a sphere, and a cube. Okay, I have 100 of these in a box. Now, I'm going to give this box to uh, box to somebody from ASU. All right? You know, within 10 seconds, they're going to drop the box. All right? Because that's how they are. All right? And then, and then what you're going to do is you are going to um, account for all the fragments you're going to get, I mean, of my ornament in that box. Okay? You're going to open the box, and then you're going to, you're going to, uh, write uh, like you the the mass of the fragment and how many how many you have on the y axis okay just like the mass spectrum okay intensity is like the, how many we have and then on the y axis we have the mass just like we are going to do now okay so in other words we're going to generate the mass spectrum for my my ornament box now okay so i'm going to give uh, give you a start okay i say that if you examine this box you are going to see, okay, so here's my mass spectrum for this. I'm going to have, uh, is there relative abundance or something like that? Relative abundance, how many you have, okay? And then here we have the mass to charge ratio. And then you're going to see peaks, okay? I'm going to say that you're going to see a peak at 20 because if my uh, ornament breaks between the sphere and the uh, and, and the pyramid, you're gonna get a mass uh, a peak at twenty for this triangle, okay? And then if it breaks from here, then you're gonna get uh, a peak at I don't know thirty for the sphere, and then another one at forty for the uh, the cube. Let's call them squares, squares, circles, and triangles, okay? Anyway, so here are three of them. I want you to draw everything possible. Go ahead. Is this it? Can we have more? Go ahead. Can we get more peaks than this? And I want you to account for all the peaks you, you I mean uh, you're going to come up with. FYI, there are more peaks possible. More than three. Actually, there are six peaks possible. Okay. 
what are the possible uh, to help some of you out, okay? I want you to account for, I want you to explain each peak, okay? That means draw the fragment that uh, that peak is due to. You have to do that. Anyway, so I would see a peak. So if I break the, uh, give me a second. If I break the ornament from between the sphere and the pyramid, okay, then I'm going to get the triangle and then this part, right? So the sphere and the cube together will have a mass of 70. Therefore, I should see a peak at 70. Okay, why? That's the mass of the sphere and the cube together. Okay, I'm sorry, the circle and the square together. Okay. What other peaks do you expect to see? Go ahead. All right, I think there should be enough time for that exercise. Okay. All right, now here's what we're going to get, I think. Okay. Now, now if we break, sorry, okay, if we break the ornament from here between the sphere and the cube, I'm sorry, I'm keep saying the sphere and the cube. Let's 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 go to two dimensional space here. I mean, if we break the ornament between the circle and the square, okay, then I'm gonna get a peak at fifty. Right for what? So it's gonna be. Uh, no. Let me let me do it this way. Okay, for uh this fragment of the molecule or the ornament, okay, and that's gonna be a mass of fifty. Okay, what about the sixth one? Any idea? The sixth peak is due to Lucy. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so so some of these ornaments. Okay, survive even the, the toughest ASU people. All right, so we're going to see a peak at, I don't know, um, at 90, right? So 40 plus 30 plus 20 is 90. So we might see a peak at 90 as well. Okay, why? So that's our intact ornament. Okay, it's going to be all three parts of the ornament together. Okay, so this will be uh, my possible peaks, and this will be the mass spectrum of this ornament. All right, what questions, concerns, comments do we have? We see uh, some hands. I'm going to come back to you, sir. Can I can I have the microphone that, uh, what's your name, miss? Aliana? Yeah. Aliana, go ahead. Um, How are you determining the height of the peaks? Uh, it's random. I have no idea. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just randomly, you know, um, you know, determine the height. Okay. Now here's the thing, though. Here's the thing, though. Now, if we have, if, if we're given a mass spectrum, if a certain fragment, we call them fragments, right? The fragments of the ornaments, ornament, or the fragment of the molecule. I mean the same thing. Okay, we're on the same page here, right? If a certain fragment has the the highest peak, okay, what that means is that particular fragment is more stable under the harsh conditions of mass spectrometry. Okay. In this case, if we have the highest peak at 50, that means the triangle and the circle together is more stable under these conditions. That's why we get the highest peak for that. And the same thing happened in mass spectrometry. Yeah. So if we see a highest peak in, in the mass spectrum, that is because it is more stable under those conditions. All right. What other questions, concerns, comments do we have? Did you have a question, sir? Or was it the same question? Okay, I have the microphone there, please. What's your name, sir? Uh, my name is Paul. Paul, Paul, go ahead. Triangle and square. Oh, why didn't I draw triangle and square? So, so Paul, here's the thing. Okay, I'm not saying it is it is totally impossible for but for that to happen. Okay. So this ornament has to break from okay the triangle and the sphere needs to I'm sorry triangle and the circle needs to separate and the circle and the uh, the square needs to separate and then they'll recombine right somebody has to glue them together I mean that's not going to happen like you know I mean that can happen but it's kind of rare right yeah so that's why I didn't do that I mean, I, I want to keep it as simple as possible but in mass spectrometry like for actual molecules things like that can happen rarely. But we're going to keep it simple. 
but in this case, it's not going to happen because I mean somebody has to glue them together for that to happen. That's yeah, the cheating. Yeah. All right. Do we have any other questions, concerns, comments? Anything else? Yeah, we have another question. Thank you. What's your name, Miss? Abby. Something so again? like sorry, but Abby. Abby, go ahead. Yeah, so based on what you're saying, like you need something to combine them together. Why'd you pick the circle? Like why couldn't you use the square to combine them? I didn't combine anything. Like, well, you say you need something like glue it together. I'm so, so I'm not like, doing anything together. I said we should not do that. Oh, um, don't do that. Yeah, yeah, don't do that. Okay. We are just <laughs> breaking things apart. We are fragmenting it. We are fragmenting the molecule or fragmenting uh -huh. the ornament. That's all we are doing. Yeah, but like how you said that, like he asked why you don't do triangle with square. Like, why is it <laughs> why is it triangle and circle, circle and square? Like, why can't it be like triangle square? Because <laughs> for the triangle and square to combine, Abby, then so somebody needs to do it, do it, you know, artificially, right? So when they break, right, they're gonna separate into tri to triangles and squares, yeah. But unless somebody like you know glued them together, you're not gonna get it back. You're you're, you're not gonna get triangle and square together, right? Because they are not they they are not close to each other from the beginning, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But look at this now. The triangle and the circle are together, yes. and the triangle and and the circle and this uh, the square are together, yes, in the in the intact ornament. But the triangle and the square never touches in the in the entire ornament. So therefore, we cannot get a fragment like that because okay. they are not there to begin with. So the, we cannot get that fragment. Oh, so it's based like on that shape right there that they gave, like yeah, it's like this. Okay, square. say that you have a like 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 a. A uh, 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 um, glass hose, all right. So, so like, like if if you drop it, you're gonna never get a fragment with the horse's uh, face and the tail together, right? Because they are not begin, they're, they're not you know close to each other to begin with. Therefore, you cannot get that. But you can get the face and the front legs together, and the tail and the back legs together. Okay, things like that are possible. But you know, tail and the head together is not possible because they are far away from each other. Yeah. That makes sense. Thank yeah. you. All right. Now, that's why the molecules are interesting. All right. So my ornament is like a molecule. Okay. And then in the, under harsh conditions of mass spectrometry, the molecules break into pieces. Okay. And as a result of that, you're going to get fragments of the molecule. Uh, and then different masses will give us different peaks in the mass spectrum. Just like this. All right. And you're going to do things like this in the exam. Okay. You will have to do is that this is an example for sure. All right. Now, one last question from this. Now, if I want to get the uh, mass of the entire ornament, okay, or the entire molecule over here, okay, which P can I use? I'm going to label them really quickly here. So let's call them, okay, A, B, C, D, E, F, and the song, all right? So, so here are my peaks on your whiteboards. Which peak can we use to determine the mass of the entire ornament? Go ahead. Which peak can we use to determine the mass of the entire molecule? Come again. Sorry. Sorry. Can you please write your answer on the whiteboard, please? I said, please, twice. All right, can I see your whiteboards? Which peak can we use to determine the mass of the entire ornament, entire molecule? I see, you can see it as well. I see F, all right? The F is the peak that tells you the mass of the entire molecule. F, I, it's okay. Anyway, not anything else. Now, anyway, you're right, okay? So, this peak is for the entire molecule, and this peak has a special name as well. This is called the molecular iron peak. Molecular iron peak. Okay? Remember, it's not about the height, 
it's about the mass it's about the rightmost peak the rightmost peak gives you the molar mass of the entire compound okay, okay. yeah yeah i will come back okay all right so now i i mean i got an interesting question actually so you see that the highest peak is test to i'm going to close this now it's enough time so highest peak is uh, set to and you give you that inner code as well 100% all right and then all the other peaks are represented or presented with respect to the highest peak okay highest peak is set to 100 and the, all the other peaks are presented with respect to that okay that's what they have done here anyway so let's see your responses over here oh look at that most of us said it's option c and some of us said b okay because it's the highest peak okay i told you once i'm going to tell you again the height does not matter get over yourself okay it's about it's about the right most peak okay that gives you the molar mass of the entire compound height does not matter i'm biased of course oh. anyway anyway do we have any questions concerns comments at the moment anything peaks go ahead And I'll have the attendance code as well, okay? So in exams, you will ask to draw the fragments of the molecules corresponding to each peak in the mass spectrum. There are questions like that before, and then I, I mean, uh, I can imagine a question like that in your uh, next exam as well. All right. Now let's think about this. All right. So here's the trick. Now, now, just like our ornament broke from, like you know, in between the uh, main parts. Okay. Our molecule also breaks between the atoms. Okay. That means we can break the bonds. Okay. So when it comes to our molecule over here, this is our molecule structure over here given to you. This can break from over here, over here or between this carbon and hydrogen bond. Okay, these are the three places where this uh, molecule can break. Now let's explain these peaks over here. So we know our entire molecule has a mass of 12 plus four plus 16, which is 32. Wow. So we have a peak at 32 over here due to the entire molecule, CH4 plus, CH4O, the entire molecule. Okay, that's 32. And then you get a peak at 31 because okay. when you break, if you break from here, so let's call this X, okay? And you're gonna get CH3O plus, because plus is there because I mean, otherwise we cannot detect that in the mass spectrum, okay? And that's that. And then we see a peak at, I don't know, give me a second, that's my, I'm okay. Yep, yep, yep. All right, and then see, we see a peak at, I don't know, let's say 30, okay? It must be due to CH2O, okay? And we see a peak at 15 over here, and that must be due to when we break the molecule from over here, we get CH3 plus, CH3 fragment, okay? That has a mass of 15, all right? And then we can, like, just like that, we can justify uh, the peaks in the mass spectrum, based, I mean, by fragmenting the molecule from the bonds. We have that. All right, so we continue from here on Thursday. I'll see you on Thursday. Bye, everybody.